spinning nodes, those peers, they will start to interact with the other peers. They're all spinning. And for every transaction that is proposed on the blockchain, the different peers will need to achieve consensus. Like, yes, this transaction is a valid transaction. And through a cryptographic algorithm that is called PBFT, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance uh, Protocol, they come to consensus, indeed, this transaction between bank A and bank B is a valid transaction. It's encrypted with a transaction certificate, so nobody else would be able to see and to look into that transaction unless you have the, the authority to do that. But still, it is a confirmation that the transaction has taken place. To make it a little bit more complicated for you, these peers can be validating peers, endorsing peers, and just operating peers. So they can have different functions and roles. Why is this important? Because when you go for one transaction every 15 minutes, peers can keep running, they can easily process the transaction, no problem. But when we are talking about RecTech and FinTech and the high volume of transactions, those peers need to be very, very powerful. That's why companies like IBM are so interested in this technology. You need a lot of processing power to process the transactions, the smart contracts, the consensus mechanisms, coming to a consensus and storing everything in which is the key of the whole point, the whole point is the orange part. The orange part here, it says ledger, the distributed ledger technology, the distributed ledger is the golden record. It's the unique truth. So all the peers that are spinning and all the participants, they can look in the ledger and they see the unique truth. And that unique truth is constantly being updated. And any individual transaction that takes place in the history is recorded. So no way to change a transaction, no way to change history. If you keep track in the blockchain of the history, like this has taken place in this country at that date, impossible for any party or organization to change the course of the history. It's history. It is becoming a fact encrypted in the ledger, the distributed ledger, now, the distributed ledger can have a whole variety of applications. For instance, the easiest one is when you have a central bank and you have four or five commercial banks exchanging money, settling money during the day or at the end of the day, the ledger can be the actual accounts that the banks have with the central bank. And the transactions that go around between, on the one hand, central bank and bank A, B, C, and in between themselves, can be, for instance, an emulation or a simulation of an RTGS target two, if you remember. But given the fact that the very second that you do the transaction, not really second, it's a little bit more complicated, you create immediately the new balances on this ledger. So this is a mechanism through which you can do instant settlement. So not only the messaging, like I send you a message, I will pay you money and you wait for three days and you see the money on your account. The distributed ledger technology is a methodology and a mechanism by which you can do instant clearing, instant settlement. For instance, as an, as an example. Uh, another example could be that an individual is posting identity data about himself on the blockchain, identity application. It says, I have an ID card, I have my fingerprints, I have my iris scan, I have my driver's license, I have what have you. He can put a number of data on the blockchain, this type of blockchain. Whereas a register office, for instance, will have the authority to verify those data. So they will get a pop-up on their peer that says, ah, Mr. XYZ has uploaded new data about himself. And we, as a controlling orga organization, 
we have the opportunity to look into what Mr. XYZ has uploaded. And given that we have access to the identity card information, we can say, yes, indeed, we confirm that this person was actually born on September 7, 1961. His name is XYZ, and this is a valid identity on the blockchain. Where this person can say, my medical records on the blockchain, I will put them there, but I will only make them visible to my medical doctor. So the medical doctor hospital as a peer can have access to this blockchain and can retrieve the information about Mr. XYZ, his birthday and his blood, uh, whatever, blood analysis and so on and so forth. But the hospital will never see that Mr. XYZ as part of his identity is also a gamer in the middle of the night. And he's taken on another identity on the block, well, in the, on the internet, through which at night he's gaming and during the day he goes to his doctor. But there's no exchange of information that the doctor should not know or that the gamers or the gaming uh, community should not know. So the peers that are spinning through Node.js applications, they get information on what is changing on the fly on the blockchain and they can act upon that. And this is done typically through, to make it a little bit more complicated for you, through chain code. So on this blockchain, we will not only exchange value or assets or diamonds or chairs or computers, but we can also uh, implement smart contracts on the blockchain. Now, what is a smart contract? There is a game between Madrid and uh, Celtic, and we make a bet that when Madrid wins, you owe me $20. When Celtic wins, I owe you $20. We agree on that. Now, we put this agreement, which is a, a verbal agreement, which is a contract between ourselves, we put it in smart contract code on the blockchain. So those peers, they know about that. And at one point in history, the game between Madrid and Celtic is played. And through an oracle, an oracle means an external trigger that comes into the blockchain, the blockchain starts to know, yes, indeed, Madrid has won. Given this historical fact on the blockchain, and everything is historically traceable and trackable and so on and so forth, the blockchain decides to execute the contract automatically. We had this agreement, it was on the blockchain, there was consensus with all the spinning nodes, they were agreeing to this agreement that we had, and it comes to an automatic execution of a legally enforceable contract, including the automatic payment from his account to my account. So I take out my mobile phone and I see, bloop, the blockchain has detected Madrid has won and I'm $20 more rich than I was a few milliseconds ago. The automatic execution of legally enforceable contracts on a blockchain or a distributed ledger. So all this is just the beginning of what will be possible. If you're in the insurance industry, we make contracts all the time. For what are you exactly insured? And then at one moment in time, like a football game being played, there's an accident, the accident triggers execution on the blockchain of pre-agreed contracts. For instance, to pay out like uh, an indemnification or to give a signal to the broker who should interfere or to tell to the, 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 the garage that your car needs repair because of an accident. So it all goes automatic and it's all by legally enforceable contracts. Impossible on the blockchain for anybody to say it never happened. He would not be able to tell ever that he did not make that contract. Not at all. Why? Because it was agreed by consensus in the whole community. The whole business network confirmed that this was a valid contract that was concluded at one point in time and that, given the conditions are met, will automatically be executed. 
So from this perspective, you can start dreaming for whatever is in your specific industry or enterprise or company or organization, how you can start to exploit the advantages of this. Now to make it a little bit more uh, complicated, this is evolving technology. So what I was just saying is a strong simplification. The actual technological implementation of this is slightly more complicated than just this uh, explanation. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, so this is myself. Uh, I founded, together with a Ukrainian colleague, Hanna Zubko, Intellect Technologies, a number of years ago. And uh, the key focus of what we have been doing for the past years has been uh, integration between financial messaging networks and uh, the legacy systems or the back office systems, so essentially with SWIFT. And when you say SWIFT, you say ISO 15022, which is the messaging standard in the financial world. And you, say, you can also say ISO 20022. So for the past 10 years, we've been playing around with ISO 20022 uh, to make it work in uh, actual transactional environment. So from there, a number of years ago, uh, we moved into the space of blockchain. And uh, at the moment, we have uh, concluded formal partnerships with our company, with Swift on the one hand, with IBM, that is going to be a major player in this private permissioned blockchain space, as well as Oracle, Oracle the database provider, who is also now developing real use cases in this domain. Our company has become, a few years ago, founding member of Hyperledger. By a show of hands, who knows about Hyperledger? Oh, so many people already. So, so we became one of the founders. And since the beginning, we are co-developing technology so that we uh, constantly help improving Hyperledger itself. And we are developing all kinds of use cases on the basis of not only Hyperledger, but essentially Hyperledger. Uh, does this work? Yes, it does. So in the meantime, we've been doing projects around the globe, uh, except Australia. We have not been active in Australia. Uh, we, have, uh, we grew out of nothing, a two-person company, to international presence with uh, interesting activity in New York, because a lot of what is going on in the blockchain space today is happening in New York. Uh, because you have the big financial players there, JP Morgan, DTCC, uh, Bank of America, Citibank, and they're all investing in this. In Spain specifically, we know that BBVA, for instance, Santander, very active in this space. So we're headquartered in Brussels. We have our own uh, development center in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, where uh, high-level engineers are constantly developing new code on these blockchain, on these spinning uh, uh, nodes. That we have also uh, started uh, two years ago a blockchain a research and development entity in Lisbon. So we're now growing a team in uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, very recently, uh, we started cooperation with the University of Coimbra where uh, bright students are also going to get trained by ourselves in blockchain technology. Uh, we take them on board as employees and we are immediately starting to develop uh, solutions for all the names that I've just mentioned already. Uh, we have a, a small office that was shaken recently, last week, uh, because of the earthquake in Mexico City, but uh, our people are okay, so that was fine. Uh, starting activity in Frankfurt and uh, occasionally also in, in Holland. This is just to give some background from where we come. Where, with everything we did so far, as I suggested before, ISO 20022 is very important for us. So we were one of the first presenters on ISO 20022 a number of years ago at Cybos, SWIFT conference. And from there we also uh, got some knowledge about FIX, EDI, and so on and so forth with a variety of protocols that you may not be able to read from behind, but uh, they're just there on a variety of networks. Uh, Target 2, SARI network in Saudi Arabia, KCD network, Kuwait, 
uh, Abix uh, as a protocol, blockchain, of course, Swift, uh, Fedwire, uh, with a variety of applications. Because blockchain initially, uh, well, the two of us, we can start a blockchain on each of our laptop computers, and that's a valid solution, and it will work. But if you want to make it industrial, and you want to go really to enterprise solutions with a high volume of transactions, you really need the power, the resilience, the scalability uh, for uh, having those high volumes of transactions, and we call that the enterprise-ready blockchains. So again, the picture before that I was drawing, which takes us away from the public permissionless Bitcoin-like blockchain thing, we totally move to the other side, is the industrial, hard-working peers that run thousands of transactions in financial space. So that's, that's where we focus. So a little bit of history about uh, our experience with blockchain and DLT. Uh, we did never look really into the Bitcoin blockchain part. We are still very careful about the cryptocurrency part of it because we deal with financial institutions and central banks. And usually those guys don't really like you to look into the real cryptocurrency part of it. Uh, we did have a good experience with Ripple. Ripple, no? Yeah, most of the people know about Ripple. So we became the first global integrator for Ripple into banking systems. Uh, we did very interesting projects in that respect. But uh, we shifted a little bit away from Ripple uh, for good reasons, uh, but still very good technology. Uh, that brought us uh, into the space of Ethereum, so which was this you know, uh, permissionless public. Uh, we were in the actual meeting where Vitalik Buterin announced for the first time Ether, Ethereum, and the concept, and then we were now and still are today working with Joe Lubin, who created Consensus as a services company who is developing on Ethereum blockchain. And we will also make the link with 2017 Quorum. So JP Morgan went its own way with Ethereum, and they built on top of that their enterprise version, which is called Quorum. Uh, so to observe, I think, uh, is what is written there. So Ripple is becoming a very, very strong partner in this. Ethereum will stay for a number of applications where it's okay to have the permissionless uh, network where you pay eaters in order to do the transactions. With Ripple, you pay XRPs when you do the transactions, probably known to you. And XRPs are also going up in value. And then the, the story brought us to Hyperledger where we are at this end of the spectrum, which is uh, the, the permission, the, the private permission. And the other symbol there is chain.com. There's also another player that you should uh, keep an eye on. It's big chain DB, maybe also known to you. But the whole industry at the moment, as far as we can feel it, especially for these enterprise applications, is moving to, towards uh, Hyperledger, uh, Quorum, and the red C that you see in the upper corner uh, stands for Corda. And Corda is a consortium with a number of banks, and they have created our tree consortium, and they, have cr they are creating a totally new DLT, uh, which puts a big emphasis on uh, their implementation of smart contracts, so legally enforceable contracts between banks with a unique uh, ledger which is like this distributed ledger, their distributed ledger, uh, which is now being, uh, at, I think this week or next week for the first time, it's going into production. And there will be an enterprise version of Corda by uh, January 1st. So this is evolving, this is moving. And I think for the purposes of this conversation, which is forward looking to the future, what is there today and where are we going to? I think we should strongly suggest to look into Hyperledger in this private space, uh, Corda, and potentially Quorum, because those are really taking off, and those are really being implemented today in real life projects. Uh, in terms of the timeline for ourselves, we did initial research in 2014, uh, then Ethereum, uh, then 2016 was Hyperledger, 
Uh, we were the proud winners of ABN AMRO Hackathon in, uh, on Hyperledger, and now Corda Quorum, and the most part of our development goes on, uh, on uh, Hyperledger at the moment. In terms of blockchain approach, so I was describing earlier in this graph with the peers, the architecture, and this is the basic architecture. This is when you start a blockchain project, what you deploy. You, you deploy peers and you make the peers run and you deploy chain code on the peers and the chain code uh, is part of the business logic that you want to put in there. So this is how it goes. And then the chain code can be whatever. Uh, in terms of the blockchain itself, the infrastructure layer, uh, you can deploy it in the cloud, Amazon Web Service, IBM, Bluemix, whatever, or you can do it on your own instances. And I'm very curious to learn what you're going to do in Spain with your blockchain, how it's going to be implemented. And we would make a strong suggestion to look into Hyperledger. You put a number of peers, you deploy the chain code, and you can get it running. Uh, interesting is that IBM is very much pushing that technology for the time being. Uh, IBM already being in all central banks in the world, all the banks in the world, all the institutions, so it helps the process for adoption. And this being said, this is the basic architecture. Uh, we are uh, actively working, and I will go in more detail into some of those, on a number of topics. Uh, on the upper left, there is invoice uh, discounting, uh, supply chain finance which is the concept that different people that do a transaction in trade finance, which is yes or no finance by a bank, uh, you can have those banks look into the blockchain and monitor the process, what is happening between the supplier and the buyer, so that they can themselves reduce their risks, as an example. So that's supply chain finance application. Uh, provenance tracking means the food that we have just eaten this noon, uh, we can track and trace where this food is coming from, how it has been processed, uh, what specific ingredients have been put in, at what temperature the fish that I was eating has been uh, can, uh, kept for the last few hours or days or whatever. So this is provenance tracking. A typical application would be uh, when you have uh, Adidas, Adidas shoes, whether yes or no, there has been child labor involved or not. So you can track and trace uh, where exactly the components come from, from any asset that you have in your hands. Uh, another application that you probably know is Everledger. It's been built on Hyperledger also. From the second that you take out the diamond from the mine, you will uh, identify it. So each diamond has a unique signature and the unique signature of the diamond goes on the Hyperledger blockchain. Whenever that diamond shows up in Israel or in Russia or in wherever, it can uniquely be identified as this diamond that was originated in that mine at that specific moment in time. So again, the blockchain tracks and traces the history and you cannot change the transactions. The one on the upper right corner, uh, if you talk to ECB or central banks, and I don't know whether central bank is here in the room, or at least ex-central bankers are in the room. So on the basis of swift messaging, you can actually transact money exchanges between central banks and banks on a private blockchain. You can even take the next step is that as a central bank, you can issue the digital currency, like digital euros, on the ledger. And you can distribute the digital euro on the ledger to the different banks. Now, in the jargon of SWIFT, uh, these transactions, they would go as MT202 messages and the equivalent in ISO. 20 or 22. So these uh, standards, they can be translated into real transactions on Hyperledger blockchain, which, and then we look into all the pluses and the minuses of the blockchain, which have to be highly secure, protected, 
uh, invisible to the different parties, made visible when it's necessary to make them visible, uh, for instance, for legal reasons, audit reasons. So the whole thing that we described in the beginning. So blockchain for central banks. Uh, identity management, I already referred to this situation where me as a person, I can put my identity on the blockchain and protect it. So I can say, ah, I don't want this gentleman to see my identity data, so he will only see something that he would never be able to decrypt if he doesn't have my authorization to decrypt my data. I can enrich those data. For instance, the register office this morning, they can make a proposal for me. I'm not a Spanish citizen, but suppose I was a Spanish citizen. They can make me a proposal like, are these your data? And do you want to enrich those data? For instance, with uh, making public your uh, family situation, marital status, divorce, no divorce. It's your choice whether you make your identity data public, or well, not public, I mean you put them on the blockchain or not, and they will not be public, that's the whole thing. They will only be visible to those parties that you give the authorization to, to use those data. For instance, blood analysis, you would not want the whole world to see the analysis of your blood, you would only disclose those data to the medical doctor who needs it. Eh? When you urgently need blood, you will be very happy to disclose your, your group, for instance. So that's about uh, identity management. And it also links into uh, the KYC, know your customer. Uh, whenever a person walks into a branch, he needs to be identified, a branch of a bank or a of whatever, he needs to be identified. So you can also uh, validate as a branch person, uh, whether this person indeed is the person who says who he is. And these data, they can then be used and shared within the bank globally. So if a Santander client uh, uh, is coming to a counter in Singapore, it can immediately be made clear to the persons in Singapore that this is a valid client of the bank in Spain. So know your customer and through the mechanism of those running peers, this person in Singapore is 100% sure that this is the correct and right information. So it's not data that he provides, it's not a fake identity, impossible, because all those peers have agreed in consensus about uh, the, the, the real identity of this person. Uh, then the one uh, in the middle on the lower part, it says document management and authentication. Uh, notary services, you have a notary, you have a labor contract, uh, you cannot tamper with your labor contract, it will be hashed and stored when you change one byte or digit, when you change your salary from 1,000 to 10,000, it will pop up, it will give a red screen, and then people can immediately see that this is not a valid contract anymore because it does not comply with, again, the unique truth in the unique ledger, the golden record, as soon as there is a, a mismatch, the person who is looking at it will be notified like this is uh, something which looks like fraud. So we cannot accept this and potentially take legal action. Legal action means that in our concept, we do have an auditor, we do have a legal instance who can potentially claim the transaction certificates and look into that transaction and verify, okay, yes, I can legally testify and confirm that this was the labor contract as it initially has been concluded. So, so you see there's a whole concept of the contracts that go on the blockchain, the agreements that go on the blockchain, the encryption technology that makes it a unique piece of data that you cannot change anymore in the future. A little bit more specific, maybe, Difficult to see from the back, but the, one of the things we have been playing around with is to make a generic um, middleware that links the existing world, 40 years of development, into whatever comes up as new blockchain uh, solutions. What is the reason? We go in in whatever organization, we never say we're going to disrupt. No, we're going to improve what is there when it makes sense. So blockchain beyond the hype, like this morning also you could feel it's hype, 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 hype. 
forget about the hype. Blockchain is just a new technology by which you can do transactions and the recording of transactions in a far better, more efficient way. And for some cases it makes sense and for other cases it does not make sense. You can stay with your centralized system as was suggested by the lady this morning, valid point. So you just have to accept it that it's just a new piece of technology that has a lot of advantages as we were already kind of suggesting. Now we are going to integrate that in existing environment. For instance, one of the things we are doing is we take any ISO 20022 message and we will process it to make it a transaction on the blockchain or potentially we will translate it into chain code that we will deploy on all the different peers in the blockchain. So maybe it's a bit, a bit puzzling, but I'll try to make it a bit more concrete through an example later. So the Hyperledger community, we have become a very much a fan of that community because it really gives uh, real solutions. It is real code, it's working code. I think it's uh, working in uh, over 400 projects around the globe already where real, the real thing is happening. It's a vibrant community, many members, uh, many developers. And then we can dream a little bit further huh, in the uh, unilateral work, <laughs> workshop that we have here. For typical for financial industry is post-trade settlement, uh, the reference data solutions, interbank reconciliations. I'll come back to that one. Uh, smart correspondent banking, KYC, as I've already said, crowdfunding, where you allow people to participate funds into uh, a, a new initiative, uh, remittances. And as we said, enterprise blockchain uses, such as the diamonds case, uh, tracking of uh, the authenticity of documents. Um, for instance, a case that is now being developed is uh, that you will be shown as a user uh, what you are active, actually insured for. So uh, you, when you underwrite an insurance contract, usually you did it 10, 15 years ago. For instance, the property of your house at the time and you never ever look into that anymore and you just make the payment and then when you have some damage or some situation, most of the people don't actually know anymore what they signed up for. So through blockchain, it can be made visible like, okay, you're insured for 500 euros furniture in your house, are you still okay with that or have it, has it increased to at least 10,000? So uh, do you have the correct insurance goes on the blockchain? Uh, blockchain for audit, and I think this is relevant for this audience. Uh, blockchain for identity, I think very relevant. Uh, identity was mentioned several times already, I think by yourself this morning. So these solutions have now been developed, uh, identity and based on that KYC, based on that digital signatures of documents, and this integrated in one uh, single approach where all the peers or the participants can make use of that technology. Uh, reputation management, uh, as you have on Airbnb, huh? when you have left your Airbnb room and you didn't leave it totally clean, you get a minus on your reputation and this follows you for the rest of ages. So you can implement uh, reputation management on the blockchain. So you once did something wrong, very difficult to get rid of it on the internet and on blockchain even more difficult. Internet of Things, it was also mentioned a few times on certain slides this morning. Uh, the link into any device that can be connected or any diamond that is on somebody's finger uh, can also be tracked and traced in the blockchain. And then the next step in the vision that we have about it, and this is a session about the future. Well, the future today is enterprise-ready blockchains and implementations, and the future is that we will analyze those data with big data, and that we will then go into artificial intelligence solutions to bring additional services on top of the analysis that we will make out of the data that go on the blockchain. So that's the vision for the next 24 months. So this is this, and before you fall, ah, public sector maybe very quickly is uh, the identity, the identity part uh, that can also go up to the level of the, the smartphone that you can authorize which data can be looked into by which type of organization. Uh, 
for instance, uh, you do not need, in the United States, when you look like 2021, you have to show your ID card in order to get a drink. Uh, if you do not want to show your ID card through blockchain application, the person can verify like, okay, it has been verified that this person is above 21 years old, but I do not need to see all his other data. So if people are sensitive about their privacy, rather opposite than uh, if you put everything in public, it's, it's opposite. You, you can really close what individuals around the globe can know and see about you. And moreover, you can track and trace who uh, used what information about you. So it becomes even better for you as an individual in terms of privacy. Land registry, uh, e-registry, but I want to quickly go to something else. If you allow me. And then I will definitely leave it open for. It's a very long presentation, very difficult to find. Is it difficult to follow? No, to find out what you're looking for. Ah, OK. okay. Yes, yes, yes. I, I prepared a number of things. Uh, so uh, something which is very relevant for this audience, I think, and I will just take three more minutes, is uh, what we call smart match. So again, so you have all these peers. And let's put it in the context of uh, RegTech data. So you have to provide data to different organizations. And you have the banks, you have uh, authorities, and authorities need to be provided data. So uh, we are actually going to do automatic reconciliation of whatever uh, data that you want to reconcile. What does it mean? So. This was an application that we developed jointly with a telecom company, uh, Telindus, in Luxembourg. And the problem is that if you need to reconcile something, a lot of parties have their say in the reconciliation. Could be one, two, two, 10, 20, 30 parties that have to agree, like this is indeed the data uh, that we are working on. Remember that I said that we are working on this integration layer. So each of those peers has access to their version of the truth out of their systems. So we throw all that on the Hyperledger blockchain and the chain and the chain code will reconcile. So this data element is this data element the same in the different institutions that are looking at the same data. So for 80% of the cases, there will be consensus. Remember, we create consensus between the peers. There is no divergence. For a number of cases, it's going to be like, OK, four agree and one disagrees. The forks. Excuse me? The forks. Exactly. And then well, it is very obvious that the number four or the fifth has made an error in his system, so there will be an automatic correction of the, 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 the data element in the database of that fifth party, so that, again, the five parties are in sync. There is cases where two of the three have different uh, results, in which case each one receives a pop-up and says, now you have to look at this, and was it 20, 40, or 80? And each of them that were not in consensus, they say, OK, for me it was 80, and for him it was 60. Oh, they have a problem. So they will not achieve consensus, and then it goes to the next layer. Or one of those guys say, like, OK, I was wrong 60, I was wrong 60. There's again consensus on the blockchain. It becomes again 60. And this is going again into the history ledger, distributed ledger, once and forever. 
And then there is the last case where you have a real break, where there is really an error in the system. For instance, the data element was wrongly interpreted and there is a big divergence. It's a zero and it's a 150 for whatever. So in that case, uh, that will be a very low percentage of the cases. You will need a human intervention to actually resolve the problem of a misinterpretation of a data element. That's the idea. So a lot of headache today to do reconciliation. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer action taking place. If between a number of parties you have to define the right data definition and the right data element and you have to agree on that, that's a very, very difficult process and I think that's more or less what you were talking about the whole day. So we throw all that on the blockchain. We make it all spinning peers, which by the definition of the technology, they will have to achieve consensus. So if you have a difficult topic where different banks need to do some type of reporting towards authorities and you're arguing on what should it be, the blockchain by definition gives you a platform through which you can resolve those type of problems. So this is the implementation we made and we call it smart reconciliation. So automatic reconciliation of data elements that come out of uh, different back office systems that on the one hand they provide the data into the blockchain, on the other hand when corrections are being made they go back to their in initial systems. So you see you create in the business network that we were talking about a uh, unique vision with a unique truth which is the distributed ledger. In that case, when you've done that job and an authority needs to draw out of that regulatory reporting, you have the source of unique truth out of which the blockchain itself with chain code that we can write draws the data that the government needs at their request in a pool model, not a push model, in a pool model potentially a push model, but that depends on how you define the architecture. So the whole idea of uh, smart reconciliation, uh, reconciliation is to have the unique truth, the agreement on the data elements within a certain community of people. They all would have to have a peer spinning. That's probably the project that you're going to do here in Spain. And on those peers, you define the chain code or the code that will do these transactions and automatically correct the data and do the reconciliation of those data. The part of the reporting is about looking into the unique truth, the unique ledger, and getting out of there what you actually need as data. So that's an example of uh, something really very practical, how to create a consensus, how to use blockchain, how to use the unique truth, and uh, how to exploit the, the distributed ledger technology for the benefit of a business community. So maybe you want to mm -hmm. say something or open for comments or open for suggestions. Okay, mm, thank you very much, Dirk. And this is workshop track two. Yes. And, and we, um, uh, we are glad to share with you your experiences and which are very interesting and may help us a lot in the construction of the permission, the semi-public blockchain uh, that is going to to be produced in, um, within the next two or three months. But there are um, some particularities of, of the such blockchain that I would like to comment with you. Uh -huh. yes, please. The, the, the first of is that we are going to um, work on a Ethereum quorum basis uh, and Technicians uh, of, the, of the blockchains were not very sure of if that would be the most efficient manner to work uh, on, on architecture of the infrastructure, mainly because um, there might be not many alternatives to produce more efficient consensus uh, rules. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, we were not sure how to develop some of the uh, policies in, in the, because there was a document in the in the constitution of the association who, who generates the federation of nodes uh, we didn't know exactly what would be the best uh, uh, way to construct the uh, 
policies of the of operative and technique uh, procedures uh, and procedures to um, because the uh, other documents stated were, uh, were very clear. Uh, we had legal proceedings, we had a, uh, a communication policy, we had a conflict of, in conflict of interest policies, but political operative technique uh, document was not clear, clearly state, uh, stated. And, and one of the reasons was outlined by yourself, because when, when you have spoken to us about uh, um, the way to produce, the best way to produce consensus. Mm -hmm. Because in, obviously in public uh, blockchains there is no point about it. In, but but in, 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 in half public or semi-public permission blockchains there are many ways to construct consensus. And I think, I believe that there is a, a wide range of possibilities to, to develop the consensus. So, um, one of the main problems, and I will post it on tomorrow on the data sphere, data sphere panel, where we're working about it now, uh, would be uh, the best way to determine uh, the possibilities that we have to manage the ruling of backward consensus or, or, or getting back to a point where, where where the bifurcation or duplication of chains have been produced. And, and how to rule that, to, to come back. I'm speaking about permission uh, exactly. consensus. Yes. The, the, and the, the construction of that depends on much, I think, on ruling. That's like uh, mutatis mutandis. It happens the same with uh, several implementations of smart contracts. Then uh, we are not very sure how to rule that because uh, the, the prongs of the forks can be backworded, backworded, uh, uh, and there are several ways to construct regressions and to, to go backwards, and, and that's I think if, uh, it's an interest point for us. Uh, maybe you should uh, help us to develop, uh, mm -hmm. to make some developments, uh, because we have to combine the. Uh, uh, legal possibilities and, and, and technological possibilities for ruling. Uh, um, under the principle of which pri uh, private law specialists we call uh, autonomy, autonomy of, of the will, uh, mm -hmm. and there are mm, uh, many options to, to construct the ruling, but uh, we are not sure if that is technologically possible. Mm -hmm. to that, but, and we are working to, to uh, together the legal committee and the Mm, technology committees uh, to to make an ensemble. Yes, uh, for uh, us it's very easy. We are technologists, so uh, what, whatever legally speaking people come up with, we try to accommodate. Well, maybe because we, uh, actually we, we don't have legal limitations today. Maybe public administration will have to validate it because in our blockchain group we have representatives of uh, ONGs, uh, as I said before this morning. But we also have representatives of public institutions like Bolsas y Mercados de España. That's a, a Comisión Nacional de Mercado de Valores means our SEC, uh, which is super uh, or equivalent. Uh, we are supervised uh, lastly by ESMA. So uh, regulators are well aware of, of this experiment, yes. uh, which I think there is still no parallel in Europe. And, and we have uh, registrars, and, and, and we have uh, also the notaries, the public notaries. And, 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 and the way to formulate consensus is complicated. But Michal, Michal, Michal. Well, that's fantastic. 
So it's really great. And the, specifically where we got very much interested in, which is Hyperledger, from the very beginning in the architecture, the consensus mechanism has been made modular, which means that if by accident I meet the central bank and central bank says, oh, we're not so happy with this consensus algorithm, that by definition, because it's pluggable, you can take one mechanism out and you can plug another one in. Uh, as you also may know, Hyperledger is not like IBM Fabric alone, huh? uh, or Hyperledger Fabric. It's a different variety of protocols, huh? of blockchains. And you see now a kind of a integration between, indeed, different consensus algorithms that go into different types of uh, blockchains. So for me, the answer to your question is the fact that the consensus mechanism is pluggable is making it great. Why, again, on top of that, uh, if ever companies want to make big money out of blockchain implementations, the money will not come from uh, public open source protocols. So a specific business network may say, okay, uh, we appreciate PBFT, uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance, but we would not use that for our application. We would use something very proprietary that maybe at this university, I don't know, but other universities, mm -hmm. they are now developing new consensus algorithms, which potentially we then pull out the PBFT and we put in whatever, for instance, your yes, university comes Because the with. possibility of removing uh, blocks uh, by consensus. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the, the way you implement the business network with, for instance, well, I'm, well I'm always talking about the banks because they're the most difficult ones and the most keen on the security of their transactions. And typically they would require like a different type of consensus mechanism be plugged in. And well, you should hear and listen. Universities and big research organizations are now developing new consensus mechanisms. But that only makes sense if you make it pluggable. To your point of uh, creating a network, what we're now looking into is when you add peers into the network. So how do they work with the history of what was already there? So those type of problems need to be looked into. Uh, the fact that you have sometimes the one-to-one uh, -one encryption that you need to implement on top of the implementation of channels within your blockchain. So that's also an area of further, deeper research okay. where the brightest students, sorry, the students aren't here anymore, but the <laughs> brightest guys, they will be working on, on those type of things to where it is today to, to, to make that evolve further. That's what, how I feel about it. But it's a it's very, very, very interesting topic. It's also very complicated. It's complex mathematics, and uh, not Mr. Anybody can just understand what's happening there. Well, Yes. Poet, both proof of elapsed time. I can only confirm what you say. And it's again, you know, on the one hand, you have everything is open source and we're all big friends and we're all contributing. But then a few days later, companies make money with that. And they make money not by having the general open source thing, but to make things specific for this business network, which will bring your network up to a higher standard than, than anybody else's network. What we're trying to do in, uh, within that sense is uh, a segmentation of, of uh, nodes, validating nodes and... and uh, Endorsing uh, nodes, uh, validating uh, nodes. Uh, different tip, types of nodes with different degrees of authorization and functions. And, 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 uh, 
depending on the finalities that they, they were chasing. In the but show. you're building it on core, yeah, right? We are, we are, the, um, we have the technology uh, based on Quorum, and, and what we first thing we're going to try to do is create an infrastructure for digital identity uh, based upon the sovereign model. Sovereign, yeah. sovereign model. And afterwards, and afterwards, we're going to work mm -hmm. in, in uh, blockchain notary blockchain, uh, for them to, we, they will have their own nodes to work properly to simplify uh, their in, in the inner processes. And, and uh, a third step would be working uh, for the um, uh, open access notary to make public transactions and the tokenization of, of uh, notary assets in, mm -hmm. in terms of converting the notary documentation into tokens and so on to permit automatic uh, transactions in, uh, in the notary with public guarantees and, and legal proceedings uh, fully complied and covered. That, 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 that's third three, uh, three steps. Uh, but yeah, very the, exciting. The previous step is 90% infrastructure architecture and 10% further applications of all, of all IBEX 35 enterprises that are going to come in with their own validating notes and in parallel uh, research, research centers and institutes like us, like the universities, uh, with these days and designing autonomous uh, smart contracts, but operat operating uh, with experimental character, you know, with, with no third party uh, responsibility yet. or liability. Yet. Uh, yet. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well. well, you should go very fast in the direction. So okay. you have to involve the regulators. That's what we said. Yes, well, that's what we today. We have involved already, Comisión Nacional, ESMA, depending, uh, Bolsas y Mercados, and uh, the notaries and ag digital agenda, in Spanish, uh, represented by the Ministry of Industry. Mm -hmm. That's the, but it's. Everything is still preliminary, and we don't know how it's, this is going to work. So there are no nodes spinning already. Yeah, because they are now. We are now preparing the the formal. Uh, the, the association is uh, constituted as a juridical person already, but uh, now we're, we are in the period of um, commitments and individual commitments and. Uh, and general terms on, of condition, on conditions to be published and r inner ruling developments. So uh, we, uh, for instance, our university has not yet signed, signed the, the contract that is going to do in the next month. Yeah. Within the next two months, we have going to see bigger advances in this subject. But I cannot say any more about that. Okay, yes. but uh, you don't dare just to bring the peers up and running and then develop the contracts virtually in the smart contracts itself? The smart contracts, yes. This is but without, without before going through all the contract stuff, you just get the peers up and you start to develop yes. the smart you contracts. Yes, you have the experimental notes, yes. That's right. That would save you a lot of time, I think. I think, yes. Step by step. No, yeah, fast. Does anyone uh, want to participate? Yes. It's moved for later, later, and it pops up to the screens of the operators who are responsible for the peers. The suggestion is being given how to resolve the problem, and by one click you can say, I agree with this, and then it is being distributed automatically in the ledger to all the peers involved. And if this cannot be done automatically, then it pops up further, and then you have a human intervention where you have to discuss, like, okay, this is a really... 
Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Blockchain never stops. But but in, in terms of, if you permit me, in in, in terms of regulation, uh, one of the problems we got to solve is uh, an efficient ruling to determine what happens in the meantime. Uh, say during the suspension period of the market uh, until the problem is internally resolved. Uh, what what are the consequences of operating out of the um, cons uh, out of the agreed procedures or agreed procedures. So there is. The, the, so. Well, uh, to the first one, the identity and the real identity. So my colleague, Hannah, she's currently in New York. She's working with the United Nations. Like any individu individual on the globe, it's called Identity 2020 Project, ID 2020 Project. Any individual on the globe that gets born, gets vaccination or gets, uh, yeah, you take some physical characteristics and you store those that would not change in your lifetime. So that if people come to the border of her, of her life, in the course of their life and they've thrown away all their papers, potentially they can be identified through a whole global system of identifying people with physical characteristics on, on the chain. Uh, as it's done now today, it's the EID card. And there, I think it's a very important role for the EID providers. It's called EID in Belgium. It's called different in different countries but each government is issuing those cards and they are certifying that this is indeed the right card. So for us, from our point of view, integration with those certification providers is strictly necessary to make this link between the digital identity and the real world identity. Um, uh, the third thing that I want to say is that uh, today for certain banking applications, some organizations have gotten approval at European level uh, to use uh, only the smartphone device for initial identification of a person by using camera, by using fingerprint and a number of combined technologies to also uniquely identify the person. Now, this playing around with uh, the consensus and the probability that you could potentially break that consensus, I, the answer I would give is what was discussed earlier. You have these pluggable consensus models and of course, if you work with three peers, you, you can uh, kind of influence two of the three and reach a majority consensus. But then typically other mechanisms would be put in the consensus box 
So that obviously this type of, uh, of uh, fraudulent or fake consensus would not take place. Now we know the case because uh, when you do experimental setup, huh, you are with one, two, three colleagues, you can play around with that and you can fool the system. Yes, you can do that. But you would need stronger consensus algorithms then. That, that would be my answer. Okay, there was another question. And what do you mean, like a profession or? No, to provide a package solution uh, for smaller users. So that uh, you throw in, you throw in the elements of our uh, professional tool situation and your circumstances. Uh, yes, uh, uh, but I think this exists already. So uh, Bluemix, for instance, you can launch your own uh, Hyperledger or IBM blockchain within seconds by having a Bluemix. Bluemix is a cloud uh, installation. It's all there, you just configure it and you get going. And uh, they even do these meetups in the evening where a total new people for the IT industry, they are put behind a computer and in, a, in an hour they, are, they have their own blockchain implemented. In that sense, yes, I think Microsoft has similar solutions with their types of technology. So it's, yes, it, in the cloud versions is uh, readily available. But usually also, and that's our experience, you can only do very limited functionality with that. And as soon as you want to do something bigger, you, you need, uh, of course, the real thing. Yes. No, 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 tens of thousands per month, yeah. Okay. So for one, one bank, for instance, if you have 10,000, 10K euros per month, you can have a node up and running and it keeps running and you're participating in the network. So, and then maybe some storage on top, but uh, that, that would be the order of magnitude that I would uh, suggest. For me, it's just an extra line in chain code that you don't execute the Oracle, but that you, for instance, put it in a pop-up screen that informs operator. Uh, Airbus, for instance, is putting all the parts of the, uh, 
and uh, uh, airplanes, and then to do uh, like uh, early maintenance uh, before the end of life of certain parts that you would be informed, like, hey, take care because this part needs to be replaced. So you're not going to put the plane on the ground because this part needs to be replaced. You're just going to schedule when is it the most convenient time for this part to be replaced in this plane. So that's pretty, pretty obvious, uh, I think. Yes, and then also the provenance, like if this part has failed and the, the, the Boeing has come down, then you, you can check and trace like in which other Boeings do we have exactly this part that failed, that brought this plane down, so that we can do preventive maintenance on all those planes and take that part out that, that actually caused a, a serious incident. So that's the provenance case. my view that uh, f for for now it's always very specific stuff and for the future uh, I think we will see conversions in the contractual situations in the sense that they will be made more uh, digital friendly and less complicated with less exceptions here and there so there will be conversion to more standardized way of operating. Like you have the credit card around the globe, well, this is kind of everywhere now. Whereas initially you could have card for this card, for that card, for something else. A similar way that will merge into one standard smart contract-ish thing, thing, which will be executed and used on the blockchain. But the biggest problem so far is still to have really the, the, the digital version with uh, equal legal uh, impact as the as the the paper version. So the paper version still prevails, and the day that a digital version will prevail, I think that will be a difficult one. In, in a, within a more profound appro approach about what you have said, I would add that uh, the, the right to forget makes no sense. In, in the blockchain because uh, that was one of the main legal problems posed in the presentation of in the Madrid Stock Exchange last week for a Lastria permission blockchain and everybody said that where is what are the the set of traditional internet rights individual rights uh, how are they protected in blockchain but and probably they didn't understand the finalities and and and, and aims pursued by by blockchain because uh, it makes no sense to speak about the right to forget uh, in this within this context. Uh, uh, but no doubt that um, the implementation of execution processes and uh, the the elimination of intermediaries uh, makes all sense for many industries uh, we don't yet know uh, uh, where or how we can reach to the predetermined levels of efficiency but uh, no doubt it it makes sense for many in industries i have no doubt of that so in a private permission network you have the possibility to roll back transactions and if i put my identity data on this private blockchain i have the the, the, vi the visibility on what is there about me, and I can rewind or I can hide, like I cannot give the permission to anybody to see whatever I have put there before. But uh, it's worse on the internet itself, so once you put the photo on internet, it's gone forever. I think that that's the worst part. In blockchain, which is everything can be, at least if you do it decently, encrypted and double encrypted and so on, and hashed, 
You're protected. Yeah. You, I think the protection there is, by definition, a lot better than, than it is today on uh, whatever That's internet true. application. And I do believe that this identity, global identity, will take off. And the biggest thing has always been you have to give the permission to the individual to decide what is known about him or not. In the autonomous sovereign identities, yes. Yeah, so. and, and that is the thing that must be implemented technically, and then you have to have trust in crypto technology. So if they say that it will take another 150,000 years before it can be decrypted, maybe it's another thousand, but for me that's okay, so I will not live that long. Okay. The break. No, thank, thank you. you. You should run it. <laughs>